this doctrine is, is extremely clear because oftentimes what we like to do is make excuses for the things that we like, especially things that, that we know in the back and in, in, you know, deep down in our heart or in the back of our mind, we, we know they're not right, but we like to justify, we like to make excuses, we like to just say, well, this is okay because, you know, and, and, and make excuses for it. I understand, but it's still what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And we ought to be able to examine our own lives, examine ourselves, examine what our kids are listening to, and be a good example for them as well. So we started off in Colossians chapter 3, and the verse I want to focus in on is verse number 16, because this is extremely important. Uh, the Bible reads, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts, to the Lord. And the reason why I chose this passage and this verse to start with is because we get here what the right music is. And, and the, the, the title of my sermon for both sermons is Right and Wrong Music. There's right music, there's good music. We saw many verses this morning, and Psalms and elsewhere, and, and godly music. And then there's other music, which is going to be basically everything else versus what the Bible says is good music. So very clearly, very obviously, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are all listed in the good category. These are things that we ought to be doing, we ought to be singing, we ought to teach and admonish one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And it cannot go unstated that this says teaching in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That, that I believe that not only do psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs teach, I believe all songs teach. Every song that you listen to is going to be teaching you something. Unless perhaps there are no lyrics and no words to the song. It doesn't mean that that song doesn't have some other influence on you. However, the teaching is going to come primarily from the, the, the words and the lyrics that are behind it. Now, many people want to dismiss the lyrics in worldly music. And any, any genre of music you want to listen to, Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, it doesn't really mean much. I would beg to differ with you on that. And, you know, maybe take a little bit of time on the songs that you like to read up a little bit about who it is that you're listening to. And I guarantee you, just if you just think about it for a minute, these musicians, they call themselves artists, right? They're artists. They have, they're, they're expressing themselves. These songs don't just come out of nowhere. Most musicians aren't going, what's just some meaningless words I can put together to a tune that I can just make money with? That's, that's, that's not how they do it. You know, these musicians are, are expressing things from their heart. They're expressing their ideas and their thoughts and they're telling stories and, and, and they're conveying messages in their music. I mean, that's what they're doing. And I know some of my favorite artists or my favorite music groups were the ones that oftentimes would, would be very good at telling stories and, and conveying whatever message they're trying to get across in their music. But you'd be a fool to say that there is no message coming across in the music. There absolutely is a message coming across, just as much as there's a message in all of the hymns that we sing when we're in church. You better believe there is. We're teaching and admonishing one another with these hymns that we sing, that there, and, and that's why we have to take a moment and make sure we look at the songs we sing. That's why with our music program here, Brother Peter is always in communication with me before service starts. Hey, here are the hymns that I would like to sing because I give approval, final approval, on what is sung in this church because I want to make sure that all of the songs that we sing are going to be biblical, doctrinally, you know, that they're going to line up with what we believe here and that we don't accidentally end up singing something that isn't good, that isn't accurate, that isn't right. And while we do have an excellent songbook, I like the hymn book, there are some songs that we just simply do not sing because they have bad doctrine in them. So we just don't do them. So because the teaching, you know, it could just say, oh, well, well, whatever, it sounds good. Let's just go ahead and sing it anyways. I mean, a perfect example of this is, um, what's, that, what's that song? Victory in Jesus. Okay. I like that song. 
I like the way it sounds. I've always liked singing that song when I was in church. It's a catchy song. It's got a catchy tune. It sounds nice. It sounds good. The big problem with it, though, is that it teaches false doctrine. It teaches a repent of your sin salvation, which is not required for salvation. And there is no other way to spin it. I've looked at the lyrics, and, and you know, there's some songs where you kind of be like, well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if they mean this, it's one thing. If they mean that, it's another thing. This says, I repented of my sins and I won the victory. Okay? When you win the victory, it's the victory is in Jesus. The victory is what he did, not what you did. 